Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're tuning in for another Target Jobs webinar, where today we're going to be discussing extracurricular activities at university, how you might get into them, what skills you might get out of them, and how it will benefit you once you get into the workplace. So my name is Brainy, and I am joined by our lovely panellists today. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll go through just a couple of questions have a little bit of a discussion and then at the end if you have any questions at all feel free just to pop them down in the question box and I will pose them um, to our lovely speakers. But just to start with because I am very very nosy I just want to know um, are you currently a member of a club or a society at university? Amazing. So most of you are, which is absolutely brilliant. And hopefully for those of you that aren't, by the end of this webinar and come September when you've got all your freshers fairs and things, you'll be ready and raring to go um, with the sign-ups. So just to start with, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, so if you want to just start by kind of a little bit about yourself, what you studied at university and where, and then kind of what, what your job role is now. So Flora, if you want to go first. Awesome. Um, hi, my name is Flora Noble and I graduated from the University of Southampton in 2016 with a BA in Archaeology. Um, so it's been a little while since I left university, but um, not quite so much time since I left university life as a whole, um, which we'll go into a bit more later. Um, I now work as Social Media Institute Partnerships Manager for Group GTI, who are the company that manage Target Jobs. Lovely. Megan, if you want to go next. Hi, hello everyone. Yeah, I'm Meg Thompson and I graduated too many years ago to, to want to admit to that I graduated with a Bachelor of Science Microbiology from the University of Sheffield. I spent eight years working as a microbiologist, then I was a career changer and spent 20 more years as a science teacher and uh, in senior leadership in schools and now I work for the Getting Teaching Programme where I work with undergraduates and career changers who want to become qualified teachers. Nice, that's that's amazing. Lots of experience. <laughs> and I'm sure lots oh. of experience here on the way. <laughs> Love it. And Jeremy? Oh, my name's Jeremy. First, uh, I changed to the University of Birmingham. I did four years in and then um, over the pandemic, I changed to um, the Western Church graduate this year. And now I kind of work with these and with HR teams for wellbeing. No, thank you for that, Jeremy. Just for anybody watching, Jeremy is actually away right now. He's in France. So we're very lucky to have him tuning in um, with us today. Uh, but if his connection isn't the best, uh, you just have to bear with us because he has taken time out of his holiday to join us today, which we feel very privileged to have you with us. Um, and then finally, uh, Martaz. Yep. Um, can you hear me all right? Okay, so uh, I'm Mataz. I'm originally from Egypt. I studied computer and communications engineering um, back in Alexandria University in Egypt. Um, um, and then I went to the, moved to the UK to do a master's degree in telecoms engineering in uh, UCL. And now I work at Cisco as a site reliability engineer. And during my studies, I was a water polo player and a water polo coach as well. And I played for the national team. So, yeah, that's pretty much me. Brilliant. No, that's fantastic. So, as you can see, we've got quite um, a broad variation um, of panellists with us today in all their experiences. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go around and kind of ask everybody um, what kind of extracurricular activities they were involved in um, whilst they were at university. So, um, Megan, do you want to go first for this one? Yeah, 
Um, I think for me, I chose things that were very different from the science degree that I was doing. So I joined a French speaking society to develop my language skills that I've now forgotten, but um, that they proved very useful. Um, when I was applying for jobs, it seemed to be um, something that was a talking point and that I just wasn't focusing on my academic studies and science. But I also joined um, the Debating Society, um, which I think um, at that time I've got a quite a keen interest in politics, um, but also it built my confidence. It meant that I was um, speaking with people across the university sitting in a range of subjects. So again, I was getting out there and meeting people, but also it built confidence um, to understand other people's points of view. And I think that was about developing mentalization strategies and understanding that people, just because people have got another point of view, doesn't make them um, you know, um, negative people or, or bad people in any way it just means that they've got a different um, dogma if you like or a mindset but it allowed that connectivity to people who perhaps might have a disagreement with you and yeah build confidence and uh, learn about other things as well because debating is not just about debating about things that you know it's actually being faced with oh I've never really thought of that point of view well really understand enough about that that they're having to get up there and uh, put your point of view across but admitting your areas for development as well so they were the two things that I, I got involved with um, and then I did some um, I'm not sure where it counts but some part-time jobs working in factories packing shoes um, putting clothes on hangers putting labels on clothes and things like that as well so a bit broad range really yeah, no, and absolutely. I think part-time jobs are really great when, when you're looking for experience while you're at university. I know, obviously, Flora and myself working with Target Jobs, we're always keen to tell students that any experience is great experience as long as you can kind of argue what you've learned from it. Um, so, no, absolutely brilliant. Um, and on the note of Flora, we'll go to you next, because I know your kind of extracurricular is a little bit different to most people's. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not a short list. So I had done a little bit of like student politics -y stuff at school. And then I went to university and said, I'm not getting involved in student politics. I'm going to turn up and do my degree. And that's it. And within three weeks, I would got myself onto the halls committees um, that kind of planned activities in halls across Southampton. Um, and that kind of kick started my student politics journey. Um, I then kind of I got elected into the role that led to those halls committees, um, which was called JCR's officer at the time, um, but I became a halls officer. So in my third year, I was leading teams of, oh, I want to say, probably 120 halls committee officers. Um, and then recruiting about 300 freshers reps below that and training them up and all of that sort of stuff. So this is all voluntary and all um, kind of in my spare time. Um, and I then decided I wasn't done. Um, having worked two freshers, I was like, oh, I could do another one. Um, so the kind of next step for me was to run for, uh, for a sabbatical officer role. So um, when I was at Southampton at the time, we had seven sabbatical officer roles. And the one that kind of worked with managing the teams in halls was called VP Student Communities. So I kind of ran for that and really fortunately got elected um and then did that role for a year did some more work reforming halls committees trying to make them more relevant i kind of existed in this very big transitional time at universities where kind of students i think there was a big change in students feeling like the university was kind of a fun experience to do but the academics didn't matter so much kind of moving towards this is a very expensive piece of education how do we get the best value from that how do we make sure our university experience is as valuable as possible so spent a year doing SVP student communities working with lots of different groups working with loads of different people um, which was great fun and I kind of sat there and I was like I don't think I'm done yet um, so decided to run for union president and got elected as the first female union president in 10 years they'd had more presidents called Dave before me in those 10 years than they'd had female presidents um, so that was incredible um, really ridiculous experience uh, sabbatical officer experiences are really really unique anyway you end up a trustee of a charity i was sitting on like top level university board meetings um loads of stuff like that so i did those two years after i graduated university in 2016 um 
and honestly like completely like game-changing life-changing experiences really tough I don't think anybody would say a sabbatical officer role isn't complicated and hard to negotiate and tricky but the experience you get is so wide-ranging so yeah that was my main experience at university with extracurricular stuff but I also did a few bits of student media so I had my own student radio show made some stuff with our student tv station um I also horse ride so rode, so carried on competing um while I was at university through the university riding club team um and had a part-time job on site um waitressing and doing pub work and stuff which I still do now um so I will talk to the ends of the earth about the values of how like the value of having a part-time job at university but also the value that a lot of those part-time jobs where you're working face-to-face -face with customers can bring to your day-to-day -day experiences. Um, so yeah, so the way I always describe it is that I did kind of a part-time degree, full-time student union. Um, but I had a great time and have come out with a really, really broad set of experiences from university that I wouldn't have had if I had just kind of done what I said I was going to do in my first year and turn up and just do my degree. No, that's that's absolutely brilliant thank you flora um as i said flora's experience with university is very full um to the brim now when they say when you get there in the first week make the most out of it i think flora is the perfect example for making the most of your three years um seeing as she was there for five um with her um union president role so if then we go to uh Martas. Um, yep. So my extracurricular activities, as I said, was that I was a water polo player. I was semi-pro. Um, I played throughout my school years and um, eventually made the first team in the club I was playing for. We played competitively nationwide back in Egypt. And fun fact, in Egypt, bachelor degrees are five years, not three. So, yep, I had to stay there for five years and i did another year in the master so yeah six years total in university so yeah not a record that i i'm really happy to have but yeah it was, that was it but yeah throughout my five years and even after i graduated and i start like uh from egypt i worked a bit there i was still playing water polo semi-professionally i made it to the national team um i joined i played in the world cup uh which is like probably up until now still that is the second biggest moment of my life after getting married um and yeah that's for political reasons i don't want to be yelled at um but yeah still like it's it's it does so much like it for me it's 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 honestly uh i cannot imagine life without having something like that uni definitely um uh, my uni life wouldn't be the same if I didn't have water polo going on, if I didn't have that going on, if I didn't have that teaching me all the stuff that we probably will get into later on. But yeah, life definitely without these extracurricular activities that we do, whatever they may be, like Flora's are wow. Like I have to say, I am like beyond impressed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, 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 um, it's honestly some of the best years of my life and and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way um like with like what with all the highs and the lows I would never like like say I wouldn't want to do that again if I go back I'd do it a thousand times for sure but yeah um and yeah I got to go to the world cup and like it teaches you stuff that you don't think you're gonna use in your life later on um, but you'd be surprised that no, you're actually using them a lot and, and, and instills in you all those disciplines and all those soft skills and like different types of skills that you just, you wouldn't learn any other way or like it would take you forever to learn. So yeah, um, that's for me. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. Thank you. And then um, if we go to Jeremy, I'm hoping um, without the camera, maybe the, the sound will be a little bit better. Yeah, is that is that better, guys? So much better. Okay, amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, so, yeah, definitely really echo what everyone else has said so far. Um, it's been um, part of the reason why I love university the most, doing extracurricular stuff and probably why I stayed uh, so long. Um, so in my kind of undergraduate, uh, karate was my sport um, and we competed at nationals, but for some reason, um, one of the years it's really unattended and the club racked up loads of debt and we, we loved the, everything from the social element to competing. Um, so we actually convinced them to let us try one more year with 10 members. 
um, and then through recruiting and just having the most amazing people working really hard, um, we took the club out of debt ourselves and continued. Um, and I did that as vice captain and literally everything I learned about like, working as a team, um, fundraising with bake sales, that kind of thing, um, as well as all the sports side, taught me so much that I spoke about in interviews for years afterwards um, and really just made you feel proud of it. And I still <laughs> stayed in the group chat years afterwards. Um, it makes me so proud to see how big they've got now, everything they cover. Um, from what was a small sports club at the time at Birmingham. Um, so definitely sports was a massive part for me um, as well. Also, um, I got into a bit of student politics as well. So uh, the NUS have conferences every year and I ran for um, the delegate of uh, the BAME officer. So you go and you debate all the issues um, from across the country with other, other people representing universities across the country and you vote on policy. And it was really... Um, it was a lot more intense than um, you really prepared for, but you really meet some great people and, and settle in. So again, something I wouldn't have expected I would have done, but I kind of pushed myself to do. Um, as well, volunteering, probably the other thing that surprised me in terms of what you get out of it, um, not just the people. So I did some um, uh, some volunteering for mental health charity. So anyone heard a shout? Uh, it's basically a crisis text line, and I learned loads about um, all different types of things that can affect people and just really what a small, small conversation can affect and that actually led me to change from engineering to psychology um, which is what I graduated in last year from Westminster where I started my own um, society um, it's basically a mental health society and a kind of the soft skills society uh, type of thing that we've been talking about here so really what stuff actually help in a job not just the um, course so we kind of teach people how to public speak um, give presentations, um, we kind of talk in a group and everyone gets a chance to learn how to communicate properly, put on events, all that sort of thing. And again, I definitely realised from that um, what that's led me to do now, which is kind of um, work with students who literally start their own projects up, their own societies, and it's most people's favourite bit about their experience in uni, so why not um, help more people do it? So yeah, that's me. No, that's lovely. And just to draw upon a little bit there that you said about like starting up your own society, mm -hmm. if there is kind of students watching that have something that they feel really passionate about that they maybe don't have the opportunity for at their current university, do you have any kind of tips or anything for, for how to go about that? I know my friends and I at university, we were all in many a society um i could go on for hours about that so i won't story for another day um but we always wanted to kind of start up an acapella society because yeah. um university of leicester didn't have one and we used to absolutely love the films pitch perfect but then we just never did it um but that is something that i would probably change if i went back to university so do you have any tips for students that maybe want to start something up yeah i mean that's a great idea for a society <laughs> um, <laughs> so actually since starting that we moved to three other universities and actually it's because the setup is pretty much the same anywhere you go um, it's normally you need literally three people uh, so maybe a president a vice president maybe a treasurer or something like that, that it varies a little bit um, you then kind of say what your idea is that would be a perfectly fine idea and there's as long as there's not another society doing the exact same thing you have maybe three people um, you do a little bit of a panel assessment and yes, you should support you from there. They support you with everything from um, different ideas you might want to do, training from recruitment, safeguards, stuff you wouldn't know how to think of dealing with a society, help you at Freshers' Fair, maybe they help you with your stall, um, having some things to get people engaged. So the uni have so much to help expand whatever idea you have. And actually, the more unique it is, the better, more likely that'll be picked up because um, it's really what they're looking for as opposed to kind of extra ones. So if you have an idea, maybe just even if you don't have a, somebody that you know who might be interested in it, just speak to people you know, or even maybe put it on your Facebook pages and Instagram pages and see if anyone's interested in joining. You might make your best friends for life just from starting it up with them. So it's, it's just way easier than you think. Yeah, yes, that, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to pop a um, question out to all of you. So whoever wants to answer it, just shout um but what do you think was kind of the main skills that you got out of joining a society um whether it be a society part-time work volunteering um being a member of like the student union what would be your kind of 
maybe top two skills that you think you got out of it? I can go. I don't mind. Um, I think for me, belief in myself. Students' unions are weird places, and the more you get into them, the weirder they become. But they become this really tight knit community of people. And what's really I've always found really interesting is like when, especially when you go through the election processes within a students' union, you you're marketing yourself. It, it's kind of like building a LinkedIn profile. You're branding yourself. You become your own personal brand. So for me be able to like communicate what I stood for and what I believed in and what I could do for people and then people having faith in me to deliver that like that was a massive confidence boost um so yeah confidence and I think also just communication the amount of people you meet at university when you get involved with extracurricular stuff and whether that's within your university life so whether that's kind of clubs and society students unions academic representation or whether that's a part-time job outside of university the more different people you can meet the better your communication is going to be, the more diverse your friendship group becomes. And it, it generally just helps you become a bit more of a rounded person. And then when you're going on into your career, it makes it a lot easier because you've got lots of different experiences to talk about talk about, and you don't just have to keep going back to when, when I did this in my degree or when I did this group project, like you, you've got a plethora of examples to bring up rather than just being having to refer back to the same group project five times because that was the most teamwork you did in your three years. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, anybody else? Top two skills that you learn from your extracurricular? For me, I can go if, uh, if that's all right. Um, for me, it was um, to know firstly how to work with different teams, different personalities, um, uh, because if, if, if it's not always the same. Like within a team, like it changes, things change, the system changes, and basically that's life that that also prepared me a lot for going into my professional life because again once you go into work this is going to happen whether you prefer it whether you like it or not um it helps you manage that it helps you how to be you know how to be stable how to take it in and be able to still perform in the best possible way that that you know that benefits you and the organization you're working with um whether that's like probably that's going to be applicable to everything, whether it's a student union, whether it's, it's a, your, your work, whether it's a te sports team, it's going to be the same. And uh, another thing, it, like for me, like water polo had really taught me, especially because um, I played with the older teams as well, as well as I was captain of my, like my team. So I, like I was 16 year old playing in the first team. So I had to lead my team because I had that experience and I was in that position of taking that extra bit of responsibility. Uh, and I also, once I went and I played with the first team, um, I had to, you know, relinquish that part where I need to let go of the role of being the captain of the, being the leader and actually following the, the, the leader in that team, following the captain on that team. And it, 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 it sounds Probably like for a lot of people, it sounds an easy thing to happen, but it's not. You, you, it's not easy to step outside of the shoes you're used to and take on a different role, whether that's, you know, and, and that has really taught me when to lead, when not to lead, when to give someone else, um, when to follow someone else's like lead, when to let them take control of that thing, when to take control yourself of another thing, because it teaches you how you can firstly identify your strength and identify your weaknesses in terms of like working with people or like being in general, having that honesty with yourself because you don't want to be in the position of being responsible for something and messing it up. Um, so that is one of the, like, I, I would say this is like, these two are the biggest skills I got out of this. And as Flora was saying, you get a lot of experiences like you can talk about them forever and ever and it's not just related to your course it's not just related to this or that you have all these experiences and, and again again to flora's point like diversity you you meet a lot of different people you get put in a lot of different situations um so yep yeah, i don't want to like go over many points but there's a lot i've learned from being in that situation especially as my role changed from player to player and coach to being member of the committee overseeing the water polo of the club. Um, so, yeah, 
things things um, changed. <laughs> so yeah. I can go. Um, so just really how far uh, uh, I think confidence is mentioned and self belief is mentioned as well. But once people actually get behind something, they feel that they belong to it and it belongs to them, whether that's sports teams, an acapella group, whichever, how much you can do. I mean, um, I think at the beginning, everyone's like, oh, I can't email the uni about that. I don't want to bother them. But once they care about it, they can raise thousands of pounds. They can uh, recruit hundreds of people. Um, there's people that have really come out of their shell um, once they've got into activities and just become completely different people. And it's just been so great to see that. And it's really just comes from really caring about what it is that they're doing. So that's really given me and those other people I know confidence in all walks of life, um, just to go for it if you care about something. And then uh, the second thing is probably how many things are necessarily, um, I guess, slow and siloed and separate when they could be working together, especially at unis. Um, and whether that's kind of different societies, different departments, if you just get them to work together and say, we've got all got the same idea, we're trying to put on the same event or reach the same sort of target, you can just get people to really save a lot of time and energy and um, collaboration really, really works uh, with in ways that you wouldn't expect it to. So always ask the question. If you get a no, you get a no. Um, and yeah, that's I think the second thing I think of. Yeah, I guess it's my turn now. Um, for me, I think um, just, you know, completely agree with, um, you know, the rest of the panel in terms of the um, transferable skills. But looking back and, and, you know, on my career, I realised the main skills that I learned were the self-awareness and self-reflection. I'm thinking about how I was building relationships with others, because for me, Throughout any career, if you can't build positive relationships with people, you're in, you know, you have to work with a variety of people. So the range of things that I did at university, from working on the shop floor to the debating society, there were very different people that I was mixing with um, and having to build relationships with. And so when you do enter the world of work, you you you're in a real strong position or a stronger position um, had I not taken part in those extracurricular uh, events and activities to understand perhaps different people's backgrounds and perspectives and the way that they might think and the way that they approach their work and their job and what it means to them. Um, so, yeah, um, and that increased my self-awareness. So I think self-awareness and communication building relationships and the other thing is time management and organization um Laura, you're going to tell you're going to tell us that you got first class honors degree i'm certain of that um absolutely not <laughs> i got 59.5 and they rounded me up to a t1 i am I, I i could not have nailed it anymore if i tried so one of my other points was going to be please don't do everything that i did if you don't think you could do your degree because you do need to go for the good degree as well because you know the range of skills and the, and the things that you you know you took on it is um it's unbelievable and um you know and everybody else crossed the panel as well i'm just sitting here thinking my goodness me you know you all sound amazing and, and wonderful and taking on real sort of leadership roles and i'm not sure i did any of that but i think the skills in terms of leadership the skills that i developed i think have been um you know, really transparent throughout the whole of my career in terms of self-awareness, building relationships and being organised. Um, so they're the three, for me, I think, that have pretty much shaped my values as well um, in the workplace. Um, I think yeah. that's the thing, though. Like, you don't... <laughs> Like, we don't have to do masses and masses at university to get benefit out of doing extracurricular stuff. Like, we're all quite keen people. Like, we're all people that got low involved in quite a few bits and pieces at university, but you don't have to do that. Like, you can't, there's nothing wrong with turning up to university and focusing on your degree and graduating with the degree you want. It's about how you kind of shape, use that experience. And also, I mean, if you have a really great group of friends within your course and your halls and stuff like that, and you feel like you've got a rounded life, 
maybe you don't need to do masses of extracurricular stuff. But I think the one thing that extracurricular stuff does give you is it gives you an opportunity to fail in a safe place. Because in the outside world, if you if, if your society if your business goes bankrupt bankrupt as opposed to your society going bankrupt, there's nobody to bail you out. But I think university and students unions in particular have this really great ability to help you get like help you get things wrong and then work your way out of it so you can learn when or not to make those mistakes. And kind of going back to your point, Megan, like my list of things I got wrong during my two sabbatical years is probably in my head longer than the things I got right. The what I learned from those two years is that I got so much wrong and burned relationships with people. And I I wasn't the best union president there's ever been. I'm very comfortable I guess now knowing that that's what my legacy has been and there were good parts of my legacy but actually I'm a better manager I'm a better employee I'm a better team player because of how much I got wrong in those roles but at least I could fail safely at least I could fail and it didn't completely destroy my career and that that is a complete that's that's an invaluable opportunity you don't get those opportunities really anywhere else yeah it's a game changer I do agree and, and having a growth mindset is an amazing Skill in terms of the world of work uh, and, and being successful from a personal point of view, learning to fail, but each time you fail, next time failing better, and reflecting and understanding why did I fail? Do you know what? It's not going to ruin my career, it's not going to ruin my life. I'm still confident, I'm still going to move forward, but I'm going to learn from it. So, yeah, I completely agree, Laura. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's lovely, and I, I completely agree as well. Um, so, we've got We've, we've gone over what kind of what societies we've been a part of. We've gone over what the most important skills are. How, how did you all, if you have applied for jobs and things since, where did you mention that experience? Did you put it in your CV under an extracurricular tab? Did you leave it for your covering letter? Did you leave it off completely? And did you just mention it in an interview? At what point did you mention your extracurricular activities? And how did you kind of broach it or sell it to the employers? And I'll put that out to the team again. Well, I can go first. Um, I put it on my CV under extracurricular activities for sure. Um, like it, it definitely was an eye catcher um, for my first job. Um, like, like the hiring, like the hiring manager actually during the interview, he went into that. Like after all the technical stuff, he just went into my extracurricular activities because, like, I did some entrepreneurship courses. I did some other stuff as well. Uh, and he was just, he, he kept on going about because he wanted to know what type of person am I? And through these things, he had like a starting point, uh, like some questions to ask. And that was really helpful. Um, you know, it, it gave him an insight into my job. Like after I got hired and all that, we had a conversation about it. Um, and he pointed that out to me. He told me like, it, like, seeing these things it, it like your extracurricular activities um and the stuff you did um that gave me an insight into your personality and i i'm i'm i was really keen to know more about that and during the interview i had these questions prepared because of like okay this is interesting let's get into that and let's learn more about you like about the potential person i'm going to be hiring and working for my team um, and that also happened again in my current job at Cisco, like my hiring manager, she like kept going, like asking about that. It, it's something that again, talks about your personality, talks about the type of person you are, um, talks about, you know, that you're not like not saying it's, it's, it's a bad thing not to have these, but I mean, it shows that you're gonna go the extra mile in so many in a lot of different situations. So um, that definitely does help in the professional side of things. Once you move up into like start working, you start moving up the the ladder and going through about like your life, basically it, it definitely does help. Um, yeah, I can jump in. Um, so yeah, very similar, uh, particularly with um, the sports stuff, so for example, the karate club and what we did with the club itself, raising out of debt and recruiting, all that stuff was something more to speak about in things like assessment centers and interviews. 
um, really as as kind of um, as you were alluding to there, it just makes something a bit different. It's just saying they maybe they've seen football before, they've seen the degree before, but something a little bit different, even with the sport itself, um, just starts conversation. I'd also say kind of with the the mental health, um, personal development, a society that I started, that's almost kind of been integral to what I've, what I've done with work since then. Um, so I think as well, if you actually are applying for things whilst you're still a student, sitting in that role, that can have an advantage because you're kind of uh, maybe even contact people over LinkedIn or employers or however you're kind of starting to have these conversations as a student and that's kind of disarming to them and you're interested in knowing about what you've done and what you're doing with the university and they may end up um, offering or talking to you about employment for that and that's happened loads for me um, and I actually ended up turning my society into a bit of a initiative that might now be um, a charity or a consultancy and stuff like that just from what it was then so I think if what you've done at uni can be its own thing you might even start to have a side business you know or even if that's TikTok or YouTube then have to be business per se but um, yeah, I think maybe actually knowing that you can create something from nothing even allows you to do that as like a entrepreneurial kind of sphere outside of work and then people start to see you as a, a partner to be working with, even if you end up working for them. Um, I think that's a great way to look at it as well. Yeah, I think for me, um, I probably came from it, uh, came around to developing with CB in a slightly different manner. So I looked at the skills that I've developed in terms of um, what kind of career I wanted to enter. For me, I, I ended up going into um, science, which was pretty much as, uh, you know, the next step after doing my uh, degree in microbiology. But I think where I ended up in my career in um in microbiology and science also was a reflection of the core skills that I learned, that I, um, I developed, um, building relationships with people. So I went more into the training and the development side of things uh, within science, which then led me on to teaching. But in terms of developing my CV, I looked at the skills. And the way that I did that is I looked at job descriptions and some of the soft skills that they were wanting and thought about oh I've done that and that really helped to build my confidence well I've done that I've done that so I've got a range of job descriptions not necessarily job descriptions that I was going at um, you know applying for at graduate level but where I might want to be and thinking oh I've done that oh I can remember doing that I've built that thing and things like you know the French um, I remember looking at one job and it said an understanding of French would be desirable, but it was a scientific job. So it's amazing where those little things can come in um, and help you when applying for jobs. Um, so that's what I did you know, with the CV, um, looking at skills. Um, and then obviously an interest, obviously, that would be a different section on the CV. Um, and then as I went through my career, thinking about the skills and abilities and special interests, they were the things that then went on to develop my values. So I could talk about my values in a, uh, a, you know, a careers interview, a job interview, and try and link them into the values of the company that I was working for. So again, that would give me an advantage to talk about, well, yeah, I've researched the company, but also their values link to my values as well. Um, and have a firm grand, if you like, to know that I was applying to the right company, not just applying that to that company because I wanted to be in charge or a team leader or, you know, a senior leader, but knowing that their values went to my values went down the right, right career path. So, so that's my approach. I guess mine's probably a little bit different because a big section of my kind of extracurricular experience at university has been a paid job because I think pretty much across the country, sabbatical offers are full-time paid roles. So for me, that now sits in one section of my CV. Um, and it's a really interesting one because when normally when I apply to jobs, I really have to make sure that I don't look at my university experience through a university lens because realistically, most people that are reviewing your CV either haven't been to university or have no idea what your experience was like at university. So I think it's really, really important to make sure 
that you don't assume that people are looking at your CV from within the university bubble because yeah you might have been president of society great but for a lot of people they're not going to have the faintest idea of what that means and even especially if you're say the hiring manager is somebody who's 15 20 25 years older than you their experience of university is going to be fundamentally different to the experience that you've had so I think it's really important as Megan said to go for kind of a skill-centric approach and so you can say I did this I did this and this I did this but make sure you're focusing in on skills that those have gained the only time that I haven't felt like I've had to like completely explain, especially my sabbatical officer experience, is when I came to work here for GCI. But that's because GCI sits within the higher education sector. So that was the first job interview when I turned up and I was like, oh, I was union president. And I, they, I felt like their reaction to the significance of that role to me matched how I felt about it. But yeah, focusing on skills is super, super important. And also, yeah, just making sure that you're not working on the assumption that everybody knows what you're talking about when you talk about clubs and societies and when you talk about academic representation or anything like that, because it, it is a bit niche. I hate to say it, like it, it's the most incredible thing you can get involved with at university. But if you didn't go to a university or if you didn't go to a university with a big clubs and society scene and a big, like, big sports scene or whatever, people just aren't going to really understand how significant what you've done is so yeah look it's taken me quite a few years to learn how to evidence the skills that I developed during my time at university but I think it's a really important thing to take into your CV and your cover letters because they're such valid examples so yeah work out a way to articulate them that helps normal people understand what you've done yeah absolutely and I just want to kind of add a little bit of my experience onto there just because it's a little bit different to everybody else's um I have a degree in in geography um in human geography and I now work in kind of events and marketing and doing this kind of thing um on the daily which I absolutely love but my job is a continuation of the extracurricular activities that I did at university so I don't really do anything to do with my degree anymore um but from being a social sec, um, charity representative, president of a society, an ambassador, helping out with the marketing team on open days, I got my job through sharing my LinkedIn profile and through having all those experiences on that LinkedIn profile, I managed to land the job. Um, so again, it's one of those things where I started doing them for fun um to to do something else I'm all very much like Flora always been one of those kind of people that will just sign me up for everything I'll do everything and anything that I can do um but yeah if you do find something at university that isn't your degree that you do love doing say if yeah. Megan had kind of gone you'd carried on your role with French you could have ended up in like a job where you were translating so you never know when you sign yourself up for these kind of societies and part-time work alongside your degree it might be that that actually is the role for you and your degree is amazing and gives you an unlimited amount of skills and things that you can talk about but sometimes the societies and things that you do alongside that may actually be where your passion lies um so I just kind of wanted to share share that because I am yeah. I'm I'm basically just still in a society I'm just still living my life <laughs> enjoying myself still trying to be a student um but no so it can kind of the world works in funny ways so you have to say yes where you can um you're right, Bryony. The friends of mine that are the, probably the most successful at this point in their careers are most of the, the mostly the people that I know through student media. Most they did the broadest range of degrees possible. I knew English students, engineering students, history students, politics students. They came from so many different degree backgrounds. But now one of them is a regional presenter on GB on GB News. We've got journalists at like the Times, the Telegraph. People that are producing like Emily Maitness and John Sopel on LBC. Like they've gone on to these incredible like. My friend Polly now produces Graham Norton on Capital. Like that is a, objectively a really cool job, but Polly, I think Polly did a languages degree. So it's a real, like, it can open so many doors. And I know people talk about like, you don't know jobs really while you're at university until you get graduate and you see what's out there. Doing extracurricular stuff is a really good way to open more doors and give you more opportunities and more things to go into. Absolutely. Um, so if any students have any questions at all for anybody, um, remember just to pop them down in the questions tab and I will 
post them to our panelists. But we do have a couple of questions that have been sent in from students kind of prior to the event. Um, so one question that's come in is, how did you manage the workload of societies and your degree? Um, as Flora said, she did full-time extracurricular, part-time studies, um, which I'm sure won't work for everybody. Um, but yeah. if anybody has any tips on how to kind of manage the workload between actually studying and then enjoying yourself on the side. Um, so for me, it was about like, it was all about dedication, like how much am I, was I willing to dedicate, how much effort and time, how much I was willing to sacrifice. So I had like priorities set, it's water polo and school, call it, like and my studies basically. Um, so at point at some points I like mm, skipped out on trips. I skipped out on stuff like that because I like I wanted to excel at both fronts. And thankfully, I was fortunate enough that I did. But it took a lot of effort. Took a lot of late nights when I actually fi started figuring out. Okay, so I'm studying this now. So yeah, let's uh, see <laughs> see what we're doing with that. Um, it was, you know, it was just about how you prioritize things. Um, like you set your priorities straight and then you can find a way around it. Um, but of course there were some times where I just did part-time studies, full-time water polo. Um, and that was impacted in my results, but yeah, that's fine. It, it happens. Um, and again, to Flora's point, you can, like it, it was a place where I could fail without like severe, um, you know, <laughs> if, if, if effects to it. So yeah, I had like some downs where I, okay, I learned okay, this is not gonna work for me. This is not what I want. So this is not the way to do things. So, but what worked best for me was um, I was used to waking up at five in the morning because we had practice at five thirty in the morning. Um, and then like before like you know my, had my first lecture or anything at school uh, at university it was like around nine so the time between the practice and school i i spent it to study a bit and the same after university like after i finished my classes and i finished the whole thing um between like the time then i have some break and then i go back study a bit and then go to practice and right before i sleep i study a bit more um so again that that worked for me but didn't work for everyone else but i mean you have to through trial and failure i would say you find what best works for you and what best fits what you want from your experience um so yeah that that was for me yeah um i'll, I'll jump in so I think definitely um, an element of boundaries as whole. Well. I think when you're really passionate about things, whether that's your course or your sport or your society, um, you might actually want to say yes, 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 or you might feel if you don't say yes, no one will, and it's your responsibility. But you need to remember to check in with yourself on that and say, actually, no. Um, one, maybe if you, you know, if you let other people um, take the opportunity, they might rise to the occasion, and um, whether that's take your role up in the society or um, whatever it is and that'll actually mean that next time you know confidently that thing will be okay and you'll have some time back for yourself and i think another way to do that is actually just have a good relationship with whatever your team is where you know okay when they're struggling i'm going to help set them with them and when i'm struggling i know they'll do the same for me and it's kind of that's the whole teamwork aspect i think that's come up quite a bit so i think really having that um is important other than that i'd say maybe like hopefully what you do is what you love and so it kind of comes as your rest so it's kind of just taking the place of hanging out with friends or relaxing um if it is stressful equally then maybe you need to look at how many things you're doing that are too um similar and maybe just make some room for things that are more social or more academic um, and just see as well last thing probably is look at things in a calendar and if you are realizing that you're putting no time in between each thing you're doing, then you're not allowing any time for those things to run over or for you to relax. So make sure there's some white space on that calendar 
Um, that's probably the last thing that I'd say to complement those things, yeah. Did anybody else want to add anything onto that or has everything been covered? I'm definitely not one to talk about time management because I know I didn't get it right. Um, but just to draw something Jeremy said, but just you can burn out through extracurricular stuff. It it doesn't mean that like just because it's not, your, not a job doesn't mean you can't burn out. And I definitely did burn out multiple times. Um, and it's, it's not healthy. And I wish I'd put slightly better boundaries in place because I think I'd be better at managing those boundaries now in my professional life, but also in my social life. Um, and also maybe to just draw on the current situation as well. We're going into an economic period where the cost of living is rising really significantly and it, student loans aren't going to go as far and rents increasing and stuff like that. So now more than ever, it's probably really important to work on the balance of what you can do and what you can't do because so, I mean, I had massive amounts of privilege because I had the privilege of free time. I did a really low intensity degree and was really fortunate to have parents that were supporting me through university, even though I was working part time. But I, my rent was cheap. The city I lived in was pretty cheap. So I was OK. If just surviving is more is more important than gaining extracurricular experience at university right now and do what's right for you, because we all come from different university eras and this one I think probably is going to present a different challenge. So it's definitely something to factor in because burning out is real and it's not fun. No, it's not. <laughs> um, on the <laughs> note of kind of um, earning money and, and things at university, Kath in the chat has asked, um, how did you find your part-time jobs? Did you go through uni or did you find them yourselves? Um, I can start on this one. My part-time jobs at university, I worked for my university as an ambassador. Um, so at Leicester, it was always the people wearing the red T-shirts that were all up in your face saying, hi, do you know where you're going? Can I help you? Are you having a nice day? That was probably me being super annoying. Um, so that was through my university. Um, so there are normally a lot of kind of roles that you can get through university, whether it's working in the library or um, in the student's union, kind of behind the bar things like that. Um, but I know, Megan, you said you kind of did some part-time work at university as well, which was more in like a factory setting. Where did you kind of find those roles? I just signed up for agents first. I just knew I had to work because, you know, I needed the finance. And um, it was a question of, right, I'm going to sign up with these agencies. Um, and it was just general factory work. And it gave me an opportunity to see get the money I needed really that was that was the main priority I needed the money I got the money I had lots of laughs working with people but um, um you know I did and some of them I still know today which which is which is great I'm still friends with some of them um but I also signed up for some scientific agencies as well so um yes I worked in the club the rag trade sticking labels on and doing whatever um but I also was fortunate enough to get some laboratory experience and scientific experience whilst at university because I was doing the degree that I was doing. And it wasn't, you know, um, it, it was quite boring. Uh, but actually, that also allowed me to build up some links so that when I did graduate, I actually went back to one of the companies that I worked with. But incidentally, when I was working in the rag trade, um, and having fun and finishing early on a Friday and going out with um, the, the girls that I worked with, which was, which was great fun and opened my eyes to another world. Um, I got offered um, a, a job there to, as a trainee accountant. So just to link into what you were saying for about the fact that, they're, oh, yeah, yeah, Meg, you're, you're, I mean, I went to university so long ago that it was like, Oh my, I mean, now it's kind of a real popular thing for people to go to school and to university. When I went to university, it wasn't so popular, so it was kind of like, oh my goodness, for you at university, yeah. Oh, we've got a job upstairs if you want. Do you want to train in accountants in? I was in the second year at university. So even though the, the jobs that I did were related or people, you know, yeah, I did it for the money and that was the sole intention to get the money. The skills that I learned, I'm still using today. I will carry on um, using those skills. But actually, 
I've got to acknowledge as well. So I could have been doing something completely different, um, like Laura said. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's, you know, the experience that I had. And um, it opened up lots of, of jobs for me. Yeah. I had the same experience. Part-time jobs can completely change the path your career ends up on and don't devalue a job that some people would see as like appropriate for a graduate. Like when I left Southampton, I worked in accounts a bit, literally just doing filing. And then I went to go and work in my local pub and I was pouring pints and chatting to people. And that's still one of my favorite things in the world to do. But I found my first job in marketing because one of my locals was a marketing manager at Oxfam. And she said, oh, I'm hiring for a marketing exec. Building networks doesn't have to come from these really high up university networks. They can be people that you chat to while you're pouring a glass of wine for them. So build, your networks don't have to be the big classy ones full of chief execs. They can literally just be normal people that are like, you seem good. You should interview for this. And it opens doors and that's it. Jobs are good. And that happens more than you. Yeah. One of my side hacks is leadership um, development and some of the... Um, that the graduates that, that um, I've been coaching, um, one of one of my candidates um, actually got a job because she was working part time on um, a reception, and now she's got a massive team, and, and you know, so so yeah, completely never underestimate any form of networking or think. I am too good for that or that's not me because the opportunities you'll be amazed where they come from and the people that you meet as well yeah yeah that's that's so true and um, so that kind of brings us to the end of the webinar but I just want to finish um on one last um, piece of advice for anybody who is watching today so if we kind of go through quick fire in the sense of I want to know what your one top piece of advice would be for students who are maybe going into like their second year of university, they're considering maybe joining a society, but they aren't quite sure, um, well, a society or a part-time job or sports, what would be your piece of advice to those students who are considering it? Take yourself out of your comfort zone. Absolutely, you go for it. Oh, yeah, just absolutely like step outside your comfort zone. Um, if you don't do that now, like you'll never know, you, you'll always ask yourself that question Should I have done this? Should I have done that? Just give it a go. <laughs> That's my <laughs> only advice, I would say. I think this kind of uh, echoes what um, you said for, for earlier, uh, but just really use that three years where you're kind of technically not seen as unemployed and you have that kind of um, allowance just to do everything you want and failure doesn't really count um, in lots of ways. If you want to try music or a sport or anything, just give everything a go for even if it's just for a month, three months, um, because you're going to learn so much about yourself in those three years. So when you have to make tighter decisions, you'll have so much more behind you. I think going on from what Jeremy said, but on a slightly kind of like softer side, you will, you don't get those three years of your undergraduate degree back. And I did so much, but I would give the world to go back and try 17 million different things. So you've, you've only got three or four years, make the most of it um, because those exp you don't get those opportunities in the outside world. So grab the ball by the horns because you can completely define your university career and your career when you graduate by taking opportunities. No, that's such a lovely note to end on. But thank you very much um, to everybody who's tuned in today. I know it's a warm one. Um, it's going to be a warm one this weekend as well. So whatever you're doing, make sure you're wearing sun cream and you drink lots of water. Um, that's my piece of advice. Um, but yeah, and thank you so, so much as well to our panel who've taken time out of their day to join us today to give advice um, to the students. And hopefully come September, come the Freshers' Fairs, maybe we will see you there with Target Jobs. And if we do, yeah. you better be signing up to something. <laughs> and a cheeky plug, if you're a graduate and want to come and get some experience working for us at Freshers' Fairs, you can find student marketing exec roles on our website. We'd love to have you join us. 
absolutely and you can come and do exciting things like this <laughs> yeah thank you very much everybody enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe thank you thank you guys bye